Hello and welcome to another episode of Making the Turn Golf Podcast with the Dooch and Double D. And today we are excited because we have a guest that is a hard man to track down because he's so busy and in such demand. And whether it be through his revolutionary training tool called the Pro Sender, or whether it be the plethora of tour players, both men and women that he's constantly working with, or college athletes or young athletes or just people in general, if there's somebody that needs help with their golf swing, there's nobody better than Sean Foley to help them kind of get back on the journey to finding their best golf again. So as you heard, we're very, very fortunate to have the one and only Mr. Sean Foley, who is really needs no introduction. But if you've been living under a rock or just came to golf recently, uh, Sean was one of the people that was fortunate enough to work with Mr. Tiger Woods. I uh, worked with one of my personal favorite golfers of all time, Justin Rose, currently works with Ben Ahn, Cameron Champ, Lydia Ko, and a host of other great players, Sam Horsfeld, not to be left off the list, but just a plethora of great players. So without further ado, because it doesn't really need to be said, let's just go ahead and bring him on. Sean, how the heck are you this morning? Hey, Michael. Hi, Dan. Good to, good to be with you guys. Yeah, Sean, thanks for being here, man. It's uh, We caught you on your way to the airport as usual, a man in, in, uh, in demand. But one of the biggest reasons that we wanted to have you on, man, is like I was driving in this morning to work thinking about this podcast, and I was like, how do I want to start talking to Sean? And I would be remiss if I didn't go ahead and show everybody, you mm. know, this bad boy right here. Yes. And uh, obviously the pro sender has really caught fire and has done really, really well, uh, not only with tour players, but also amateur players. And I think that you guys have actually had a tough time uh, meeting demand for this thing because it's so it's just it works very well for a lot of people. So, you know, is this the rebirth of Sean? Like, is this a Sean version 763.7? Because it seems like, you know, there's a new look. And we're we're doing the pro sender thing, and like you seem more dedicated and more rigorous than ever. So, what's going yeah. on, man? Is this the new Sean Foley? No, I don't think so. I don't think there's you know there's just the evolution, and I think that you know as 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 you're starting out, uh, we Michael and I met at uh, Memorial, and uh, as Michael found out, I'm quite easy to talk to, and you never know, you might walk for two days with me, and. Uh, my favorite is when someone walks with me and then they go, man, you're so down to earth. And I'm like, where else are my feet? You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> I, teach, I, I, I teach golf when I see guys in the golf community and in the coaching community get, you know, so tender with one another. I'm like, yo, this is not oncology. Okay. This is not like child education. This is teaching golf. So keep it, keep it chill. Leave your insecurity at the gate. Um, no, I think it's just an evolution. And I think that, you know, when I first got into teaching golf, I obviously enjoyed golf and I enjoyed the golf swing, but it was kind of more a function of survival because I didn't know what else I'd do. Um, Ten semesters of academic probation don't have employers knocking your door down. Um, you know how hard it is actually, though, to do 10 semesters of academic probation without being kicked out? I mean, it's a pretty impressive feat. Um, Took me eight years to get an undergraduate degree, Sean. You're talking to the right man here. <laughs> I, you know what I was, I was, it wasn't like I wasn't studying. I just wasn't studying what they wanted me to study. So absolutely not. Um, which has benefited me a lot more at corporate outings with CEOs than what they wanted me to study. So, um, you know, I did that and worked for John Jacobs golf schools initially. And I, I enjoyed it, you know, like, as you know, I enjoy people and, and, um, I like to, you know, I like to inspire people. And then I like being right. I like solving problems. I like overcoming challenges. Um, the thing I love about the PGA Tour and tour players, or but just golf in general, um, is just the difficulty and challenge of how hard it is to get somebody to uh, improve. And, and it's not improve within five minutes. You and I have both helped people where they've hit a shot and turned around and said, holy shit. But it's, you know, it's about laying protein around neural pathways before they wake up in the morning and they just do that. So I, I think that I do really like discomfort and I like challenges. Um, and then when I got on, when I moved to Florida with the intention of coaching tour players, I came to where they were um, or where they used to be. Now they're in uh, Jupiter or West Palm, but Orlando was the hub. Um, and I had this kind of dream that I was going to do that. 
Uh, then I did that, and I was absolutely madly in love with the whole thing, the travel, you name it. Um, 2013 rolls around. Tigers had a great year. Justin Rose had a great year. Hunter Mahans had a great year. Lee Westwood's had a great year. And here I am with absolutely a banner year and a dream year, um, but I can't be present with my own family in my own house. And so that that's not what I'm after. So, um, you know, to me, um, I think when I was younger, I was very Western in my in my thinking as, as it relates to achievement, accomplishment, worldly rewards, kick ass, be the best. And that really drove me. Um, but then it got to the point that I realized that that was all an illusion. So 2013 to 15, I'm kind of in no man's land. Um, trying to be, trying to be, you know, a great husband, a great dad and a great coach. So when I'm on the road, I want to be at home. And then when I'm at home, I want to be on the road. So I'm never anywhere. I, I'm never where I'm at. Um, and that's not a good place to be, obviously. Um, so then I kind of had to sit down and redefine to myself, okay. Um, and I think by this point, I think by this point, the only two left are Hunter and Rosie, and Hunter's on his way out. Um, and so then I just defined, okay, wh why, do you, why, why do you do this? Like, what's the purpose behind? I kind of reread the first chapter of Man's Search for Meaning. I think I've probably reread that chapter about 100 times. Um, and, you know, it just, it, it continuously brings me back to meaning and purpose. But the meaning and purpose of a... 20 year old on the PGA tour might be much different than when that 20 year old is 40 years of age. And that 24, 20 year old has already done everything, supported himself. And then at 40, you know, he opens an oncology unit for children. Like things change. You go from, you, you go from being self-centered, which there's nothing wrong with that. I don't know. I, it's like saying that, you know, <clears throat> we have to remember that 90% of our brain is identical to a chimp brain. So if we're acting in ways of the animal kingdom, which is survival and adaptation, that's fine. That's what we are. Now we have 10% that allows us to kind of, you know, think about, think about morality and right and wrong and God and all that. But when push comes to shove, it's incredible to see what human beings are capable of, right? And it's quite animalistic. And so I redefine that, okay, I enjoy learning. I enjoy inspiring people and I like being correct. So those are the three reasons that I ultimately do it. Now, I think like I think liking to be correct was just more a manifestation that came from kind of I think insecurity more than anything. So, you know, because I wasn't a good athlete, because I wasn't a tall guy, because I had all these holdups about myself. If I could intellectually bully someone, then I felt fine. And so that kind of overreach is more so that that's probably left me um that that's probably left me by now into uh I love the game, I love myself, I love my players, uh, I love the challenge, and I enjoy inspiring people. And and then I enjoy the climb, right? Like I the funny thing is I've been to the summit a few times with players, and it's just not really the place for me. I kind of like being stuck in a blizzard like at 20,000 feet on Everest, not knowing when it's gonna end. Um I just think that feels so there's so much vitality there for me um, and excitement. Um, and that's what I've kind of enjoyed, Michael, the last couple of years is, you know, taking players like Ben and Michael, Kim and Lydia, who who kind of lost their game and and help them build it back. And the way that I look at it is, you know, it's a different when <clears throat> when you're at your golf academy and people are coming in, they're learning the game. It's very much instruction. Right. So at that point, they're going to climb Everest and, you know, you're getting their legs ready. So what 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 can I do if I'm going to climb Everest? Right. I can get stronger, get my cardio up. I could train at elevation. Um, when I go there, I can make sure I have a great Sherpa. Uh, I can make sure that my. Uh, I can make sure that everything I need for the climb is great. My boots, my gloves, I got the best of the best. But after that, it's trusting the Sherpa. And I think once you get with a tour player, that's that's what you're doing. I mean, you get a 30, 
you get a 28 year old Michael Kim. I mean, there's been a lot of reps in there. Um, and I think that's probably the thing, Michael, that I've sp spent two years now studying um, uh, neuroscience and working with consultants. And the funny thing is kind of, this is the last thing I've kind of learned and it should have been the first thing that I learned. I mean, go figure, eh? Um, Every time I go and uh, read something new or learn something new, man, I feel the exact same way. I'll never forget this and I want to give him credit, but Terry <clears throat> Rolls, uh, I remember <laughs> being, guy. yeah, I remember in 2019 being at the Bioswing Dynamic Summit and I was really new, man. I was still a, a early golfing machine guy, barely had a track, man, like just didn't, didn't really understand the body very much at all. And Terry said, you know, the more I learn, the less I know. And, uh, you know, that's kind of a true statement for what you just said there. And it's, it's true, man, because it's, it does seem like all these things that we continually learn, man, it would have been nice to know those from the jump. Yeah. And I just think that like, you know, if we we're going to run, if we were going to start an academy that raised great teachers, I think neuroscience has to be in the first year and it's not neuroscience. It's not heavy. I don't know much about it, but I kind of un I understand how we learn, what's the process of how we learn, uh, why do we detect fear everywhere we go. <clears throat> These are things that are more helpful. Like it really helps the player to realize that when he gets freaked out all the time on the golf course, he's not weak. He just has a mesocortex that's been detecting threats for 400,000 years. And it's amazing when they learn that they're less ashamed, they're less guilty, but they also realize that. 98% of what they're afraid of is just perceived. It's not accurate. And so when people understand that that fear is false evidence that appears real, and I obviously didn't create that acronym, but I love that acronym, false evidence that appears real. Um, our brain is literally a threat detection center. Its whole goal for our life is that we survive, not that we thrive. And so I think as you, you look at that, then you recognize neuropathways and you recognize how, how thoughts travel through the whole system out into the golf club, you're really careful on kind of, you know, what you look to change or, or grow. And you, you look at guys and you're like, man, that guy's been like that for 15 years. You know, I mean, let's remember, dude, that, you know, social media is a place where the video that we see is the hundredth video. It's normally in slow motion. And there's no way that person could do that on the first tee. Like, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, I, I think that that that's kind of the evolution is to now is that I got to a point there after Justin Rose uh, got to number one. So after 15, when I kind of reorganized myself, I, I made Rosie like the center of the universe as it related to my career because he told me, look, I'm going for number one and I'm not stopping until I get there. And I want you to be with me. And we fucking we went and we didn't stop and we worked really, really hard. Um we were structured, we were efficient, um, and we worked and we worked and we worked and we worked and we worked. And then you bingo. gave Justin Rose the nicest compliment I've ever heard a coach give a player. I can't remember where it was, but you said when you watched Justin Rose practice, you would think that the guy had never won anything in his entire life. Yeah. And, and you know who's like that even more so? Um, he's a member at where, I, where I'm a member at, at Alworth, Steve Stricker. Steve Stricker practices from eight till eight and he's VJ. Yeah. Well, no, yeah. VJ's done a whole different psycho category of hitting drivers out of fairway bunkers for 10 hours in a hundred degree heat. So he would be just my boy, but, but the big man's not, he's definitely not right. Um, <laughs> but Stricker, it's like, you know, young one go up to him on the range and be like, bud, you need, you need to borrow 20 bucks. Like, man, you just hit 700 balls. And you just want to say, Hey, I'm a Ryder Cup captain. You know who I'm taking? I got Stricker on my team, by the way. I that yeah. was a no-brainer pick to me. Okay, he's a um, but he's, he's a great player. He's um, it's forget about it. He, I mean, he's arguably in the last 20 years one of the greatest players in the world, and that's starting in his 40s. So I I think that once Rosie got to number one, and then we kind of had a fall off, but but for no real reason. I mean, he's my boy. I love, I text him every single day last week. Um, that's my guy. Um, and then the pandemic kind of hit, um, that I actually had Danny Willett during that time too. And we kind of came back to a, a good place where he was playing great on um, that fell apart. Um, and then the Rosie thing just kind of, once we got to the top, it was like, there was almost nothing left to do between one another. Um, that's why what, 
ensues is still a deep friendship of brotherhood because that'll never change. Um, and then the pandemic hit. And then uh, Lydia Ko called me and we worked for two years. And then when she got to number one, um, she moved to San Fran. So we parted ways after she got to number one. And then I remember just sitting there and going, okay, like I've helped three players get to number one in the world. And within, within that happening, within two months, these relationships have dissolved. I'm probably going to be 0 for 4. So I've, I've got to this point in my career, putting everyone ahead of myself. And now from here till the end, I'm going to put myself and my business ahead of my players. And that's what the evolution um, comes from, Mike, as Michael, as you know, you look at the pro sender. Remember, my first swing coach is Greg McCatton, who's pretty much at the top of the hierarchy of the golfing machine. So this might be the first thing I ever learned. <laughs> so, like at 11 years old, like doing this and doing this and hitting tires and shaking hands like this and opening my hips. And so I never really veered far from accumulators my whole time in, in golf instruction. And I've been really lucky to have, uh, you know, um, to have friends who are ahead of the curve as it relates to ground forces. You know, I met Scott Lynn in 2007, um, actually got Scott the job with Swing Catalyst. Um, the Craig Davies, the all those, all the all those guys in Kairos and Physios and Osteos, um, people like Phil Cheatham. So that that was always kind of something I didn't really discuss much with people is that you know I had been consulting people like Sasho for a deck over a decade. Um, so that that all that's very important to me. So it's to put yourself around people who are smarter than you at what they what they know. And I think that what happens sometimes with the modern golf teacher is there's a there's a real stressful aspect to like wanting to understand 3D and force plates and track men and 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 so then you understand 10% of all of it and then you just sound good and absolutely destroy golf swings. You know? So it and and you know I'm kind of part of responsible for that whole generation. But I was I wasn't learning it myself, you know. If I wanted to get force plate stuff done, I would just yeah. send them to Scott. If I wanted to get 3D done, I send them to Mark Bull. I want to be I really to fair to something though, Sean. Um and and I I if you're going to take credit for some of that, you know, I continually post to Instagram and YouTube and am definitely guilty of a lot of the same things. So, we all have to be responsible here. But at the end of the day, one thing that I want to make really clear is that, you know, I kind of look at what David Ledbetter did in terms of, you know, creating an industry for us. But yeah. when it comes to creating this team atmosphere, OK, mm. when it comes to putting your your ego aside and going, I'm going to get an expert in here and mm. we're both going to learn from this expert together and we're all going to be better for it. I truly do believe that you were one of the first coaches to really put the ego aside and kind of give us, including myself, like this blueprint for, hey, get smart people on the team. You know, luckily, my assistant is an actual biomechist with a master's degree from Auburn. So obviously a very smart young man. Um, but like you, you're the one that kind of laid that template out that it's OK not to always have the answer but to know where to go and get the answer. And then when you find it, put that guy on the payroll. So you always have him around. Yeah, I think so. Like it, it just, to me, it just took the, like, you got to be able to, you know, you see that corporations, right? Like you put people, you don't put sales guys in marketing and you don't put executives in research and development. So I, I saw myself as the overall kind of manager of the team. And so, you know, I have a player who isn't putting well. Um, he's kind of seen a lot of putting coaches, um, and that's not really fixed it. Um, so then we go to a neuroscientist and while he's putting, we get a brain scan. Why not? Neuroscientist says, wow, man, your thoughts are everywhere. You're never present over a putt. And so now all of a sudden it starts to leave clues because we look, we've been to these guys who are all great putting coaches. Um, they're knowledgeable. They know how to set up practice. And we just have a player who continues to hit the ball, hit the hole more than anyone and make less putts. This isn't a yippee problem. This is hitting the hole, making no putts. Okay, so there's got to be a solution, right? Like, 
every problem on the planet is just some is a solution that we haven't found yet. So to me, you know, I can't sleep trying to figure out how can I help this guy? And it's not going to be on the putting green, obviously, right? Is what is going on? How come he cannot have access to his subconscious while he's over putts? And he goes and does that. And, you know, we'll see eventually over time um, how well it works. But it ain't a, it's not a mental thing. It ain't mental. I don't, I, and I think that that word I agree is hundred percent. Thank you. That, that word is so overused. Look, mental is <clears throat> to me, mental is PTSD. Mental is, uh, 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 multiple personality disorder. Mental is schizophrenia. That's mental. Okay. Mental is not the fact that you feel pressure over a six foot putt. Uh, <laughs> that, that's just not it to me. And I think that problem with golf is there's a lot of codependence in golf so you know regardless of the trauma that you had as a kid which we all did and i would say overachievers probably had the right amount i'm not quite sure how to define that but they had to go through it to get to it um i don't think it matters that much if i know how to get into alpha theta for 15 seconds at a time and be present and so when they measure you know with the brain waves when they measure alpha, theta, gamma, beta, delta, literally can show this is someone in love. Oh, look, they're an alpha at a super low frequency. Here's someone who's in absolute anger right now. They're off the charts in gamma in frequency. So when someone's actually present at between 5 and 15 hertz, they're an alpha, theta. That's been measured. It doesn't need to be. So how do you become present? It, we're always present. It's just it's just our thoughts that take us out of it. So how can I readjust to be back to here and be here right now? It's just I'm just focused on you. That's it. There's nothing else going on. And then it's a, it's a, it's a trained thing. So I get these young players now. I never used to do this in the past. And meditation is part of our program because there's just too much. It's not about being a Buddhist. There's just too much data on the importance of it. Just the pure importance of it. And something I've always done myself, but that was, I mean, trust me, when I was doing that as a kid, it, it wasn't, I definitely wasn't perceived as being cool for doing it. It wasn't a cool thing, so to speak. Um, and so, yeah, the pro sender is, you know, is, is, a, is a tool that really helps people. Um, and it also drives a solid business model, which is, this is a business, right? Um, because I didn't do anything like this for 20 years. Um, my buddy was like, man, are you selling out? And I was like, how am I selling out when I'm helping people have better wrist angles? I think this and is the uh, realest uh, Sean that I've met. This is the uh, most uh, real Sean I've ever met. I love this, Sean. If this is you selling out, you should have sold out years ago, brother. Good for you. Sean, yeah, could, no, I, could, could I ask definitely. you, just, you, know, you, you, you take your information from an enormous landscape of sources. You, know, you, you pull on teachings or insight from all sorts of areas. Um, to inform what you do, you know, what are you looking at now? I mean, it sounds like neuroscience, as you said earlier, it's a thing you would love to have started with, you yeah. know, to almost have that as the foundation point. But would it be fair to say that's the thing that you think is going to be the most important over the next three years? Or is there something else that you're looking at that you think, you know what, this hasn't broken the surface yet, but this is going to be a needle mover within golf, within performance? you know, over the next three years, as, as somebody, as I said, who, 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 who takes their information and insights from so many different sources. Yeah, I don't know. I think it'll take this long to, I think it'll take quite a while to be able to make this useful, um, to, to make it, you, I think it'll take, I mean, the fact is I've spoke to these people who are, you know, they're excellent at what they do. And they literally say, look, we understand 10% of how this thing works, you know, but 10% is better than what I have. Um, but it's kind of always been like this, like one of my first tattoos, Dan, because you were in Jamaica is, is lyrics to redemption song. Right. Right. So emancipate yourselves from mental slavery, none but ourselves can free our mind. Um, when I finally put that there, I understood like, oh my God, my whole life, I thought it was outside of me, but I've, I've literally shackled myself to the confines of my own mind. So I feel much more now as a coach as like just a pure mentor. And, um, you know, I'm, I have a lot of young men that I'm coaching um, and young women. And 
you know, I've kind of made every cardinal sin that you can make as a coach. I don't, I don't, I think I'm literally almost out of mistakes at this point. Um, I still can't tell you exactly what's right, but I'm completely sold on what's wrong. And so how the relationship with a player works is if you know what's wrong, that's already a good place to start because potentially when they come to see you, they're doing some things wrong. A lot of that can be conceptual. So once you change their, there's low hanging fruit and then there's the fruit at the top of the tree, right? So there's the short term picture and the big term picture. So the short term picture with the young player, like my lefty Garrett Higo is that, you know, he, when he stood, he had a lot of extension in his lower back and his feet were almost pigeoned in. So he's starting to have knee issues and lower left side issues in his back. So as soon as we got his feet flared out slightly, which is pretty natural for how you human beings stand. The problem with when we look at when we look at the pelvis in the golf swing, we look at the hips and stuff, but we don't really look at the bones. And I think bones are, from what I've learned from my friends, it's really important as it relates to creating torque and, and force, obviously, because muscles are, are uh, inserted to that. So getting his feet like that and then getting him to be in more flexion with literally within and then trying to get him to where he has more loft in the takeaway because he kind of got the, the club in and shut. Uh, he's tricky because he's the left-handed golfer who's a right-handed guy. And his left right. hand is, his left hand's quite like. I was always, I was always told, Sean, that it was, that was a great combination. I mean, maybe that's really outdated thinking, but I was always told that was a great combo to play, to have a stronger hand almost opposite the way you play the game. But is there any? Yeah. Any... I, yeah and, 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 you know, I was also told that, you know, that, you know, I also read somewhere as a kid that it was liberty and justice for all. Right. So <laughs> what it, the thing to me is like for a right, like that would give me the ability to pull. OK. And, and, and I could, you know, I can pull, but I also have to push. Right. So if yeah. my if my heels and toes are creating couple forces, then my hands are too. And if I'm all pull with no push, I'm probably going to be steep and across it and shallowing with side bend. So with, with a player like Garrick, we get loft on the club and keep the club in front of him and get his feet flared. And he starts to hit it better right away. Well, that he should have hit it better. That, that the problem with muscle memory that we have to be careful of is like, there's a lot of people out there who are paralyzed. So muscle memory as a theory is a bit, it, my point is, is that how come, you know, how come vets who have lost a limb uh, at war uh, still have steering pain in their foot, even though they don't have a foot for like up to a year after they lose their foot, right? It's because the memory is, it's all here. So the person who's paralyzed still thinks of walking. It's just it, that neuron is it's traveling through the central nervous system. It just doesn't get past the point where there's a fracture to the, and uh, where the spinal cord is severed, period. So he might have to stand on the tee and go, man, this club feels really out here and really open. But if he, if he knows that if he does that, when he hits it, it goes where he wants to, then he just has to be good at being discomfort, like having discomfort. And I think that, that, you know, that's important. Like a big thing I've been thinking about lately is, you know, is challenging really how we train because we, we have to remember, right. That, I'm going to sit there on the range and I really prefer how I do things. I really prefer what I like to talk about. I really prefer this, this, and that. Well, in most cases, that player is not there to listen to me talk about what I prefer. I have to, you know, I have to tailor make a suit to them. So the, the wool that I'm going to use is going to be the finest quality, but the suit's always going to look different because if you, Michael and I get suited, the suit could be the same, but everyone's going to think it's a different suit because it looks different. But it's still the same dynamic in the sense that it's still very fine merino wool. Do you know what I mean? So I think that over time, you know, if if I was to simplify everything and say, when someone comes to me, when you finish a round of golf, whether you're in the southwest of England or whether you're up in Ohio or whether you're in Florida, no one asks you where you were at P5. No one asks you if you shallowed the club. People simply ask you, what did you shoot, right? That's it. So when I start a lesson with someone or I'm working with someone, there's the big picture of like, we can manifest this pattern over five of six years of really passionate and mundane work, just 
dotting I's, crossing T's, dotting I's, crossing T's, right? You can write a beautiful paragraph, but if the grammar is not good, it's not going to read very well, even though it could be from, you know, it could be from Poe or Eliot or Kipling. If you don't get the if you don't get the commas in the right place and all that, it's not going to read very well. So that those are the mechanics of writing. Now, most everyone can learn to do that. Now, not everyone can learn to think like Kipling or these types of individuals, but you you get my point. So sure. as it comes into golf, it's the same kind of ideas as how do I get Ben on to get the face more squared impact and get the angle of attack less steep. That's all I care about for Ben. Okay. Uh, having less loft and having less attack angle. Um, that's what we work on. And in, in doing so, as we worked on the, the club face and then uh, we worked on the right arm, uh, I work on the right arm. I don't really think about the lead arm very much, to be honest with you, depending if that person needs it or not. But Ben is also right handed golfer, left handed person. So Ben's very good at this and there's nothing wrong with this. I'm just saying that that also needs that. It, 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 they can't both be doing that because then you're in big trouble. Right? So, you know, in two years, Ben's gone from 172 to 185 ball speed on the golf course. And people are like, how'd you do it? And I'm like, I just showed him what was already inside of him. Like, cause you're not going to see me market, come to me and I'll get you 13 miles an hour ball speed. Basically Ben was hitting it. Ben was hitting it really weak. I didn't do anything to him to make him faster, except put in the right principles that over time, they really, really helped us. So Ben's miss is still high, right? It still spins like a thousand over what it should. And it probably always will. Right. So when guys say, you know, oh, that was my old swing. I was like, no, that's your swing. <laughs> so when you talk to the neuroscientist, he goes, yeah, you know, when they say they're like their old swing or their old movement pattern. He goes, remember, you're always running from that 15-year-old kid. So the 15-year-old kid who got it stuck underneath him and slid and jumped and flipped it. And when he was 15, that was a five-yard draw. When he was 25, it was a 40-yard snap hook. You're always working against that kid. Like that is, that is in the DNA. That is just weaved in there, right? I'll give you an example. So I was working with this player one time. I won't name names. And he just looked to me. Like he needed way more linear in both directions. He needed to get right more. He needed to get left more. He needed to stand up faster. He needed to do all these things that are really uncool, Michael. And um, we're doing it and he's hitting it so much better, but he's fascinated with keeping his elbow bent and rotating, which I just think is, is there, there's not been many boxers who succeeded by keeping their arm bent when they hit somebody. There's not been many pitchers who succeeded in keeping their arm bent as they threw the ball, right? So <laughs> It's, I think this arm has to get pretty long. I just, I have this. Feeling. I agree. Yeah. 100%. Okay. I'm just saying, I don't, I don't know a lot, but my friend. Call me crazy, but your right arm starts relatively straight when you set up to it. So like this idea that we want to shorten the lever by bending it a bunch doesn't make a ton of sense to me either, Sean. Like I said, dude, I'm not that smart, but my friends are super smart. And then I'm just better at talking than they are. So it basically, like, I think these are all important things. Like, if I if I straighten my left arm with a club in my hand and try to hit balls with my arm straight, you should see it. All I can do is top it and shank it. When I bend that thing and I let it straighten, I can really move it. Now, when this gets too bent, I just top it and shank it. When it gets straight, I can really move it. So the interesting thing is when I'm doing left arm, you'll see a little more linear and you'll see me kind of pop out of it with the body too. And then when I go right hand, you just see my right hand wide with a hell of a lot more rotation from my body. So it's I'm, it, it's quite interesting when you do that with somebody, think about the idea that we want the left arm straight and the right arm on the rib cage. If you hit balls individually with those hands, you would not do that. So, it, you know, that that's kind of where I've, I've been. Like, I think my wife would even say, like, she hasn't seen me this content in a while because I'm making my own schedule. Like, I'm leaving today to go to Toronto um, to do an outing for Microsoft tomorrow. And then I'm flying to San Diego to do the same thing there. And then on Sunday, J David Woods and I are shooting a, a, a ton of content. Um, and then I've already seen all my guys that I work with in the last couple of weeks. So now I'm not going to go to Vegas. And I think that that's kind of the key, you know? Um, I love it, man. I John, mean, I can I ask that's... you? If... Yeah, sorry, wait. sorry, dude. Just, just what you were saying about, you know, over the last few topics. I mean, you talked about being a Sherpa to the golfers you work with. Mm. And you talked about, you know, being a mentor. 
I'm really interested in who has been the most impactful, who have been the most impactful mentors to you, not only in your professional life, but in the sort of balance that you talk about achieving now in your life, where you are, in your own words, more content than you've ever been. So who are those, who have the key mentors been for you? Um, well, obviously my dad, um, my dad's a pretty impressive guy. You know, he grew up in abject poverty in Glasgow, moved to Canada, um, in 67. Um, and just is a fantastic, just, just a fantastic man, period. Like, I, you know, when my, when, when my dad passes, there's going to be speakers in the parking lot next door, right? Like this is a quality human being, like lovely guy. So, I mean, look, the moment of conception almost is like 90% of where your life's going to go. Right. And so I was really fortunate to be born to them. Um, and I can't wait to see them today. Um, uh, cause they're now, uh, my dad's 84, my mom's, uh, 80, but I think, I think the universe is going to curse me with my mother until she's about 120. <laughs> my, my mom still to this day sees me on TV and texts me and says, are you eating? And it's like, mom, I'm 50 years old. I don't worry. I can, I'm not, I'll, I promise you I'll eat. But just, I think in our mom's eyes, we're about this big always, you know, all of us. Um, golf wise, um, Greg McHatton in Canada, Ben Kern and Jack McLaughlin, who were kind of, you could kind of say they're the Bob Ford of Canadian golf, um, the Dave Potus of Canadian golf. So directors of golf um, who could play, instruct, run a pro shop, run a business. Um, those guys were big time mentors of mine. Um, I'd say on the road, Butch Harmon's been the person who kind of took me under his wing as it related not to the golf swing, but to the thing, to like to the to the zoo. You know, we're we're zoologists, right? Our species are pro golfers. So trying to understand that species. Um and then, you know, Mark Bull, Scott Lynn, Craig Davies, George Gankis, Kevin Duffy. I mean, it goes, I mean, who's not really? Who's who's not been someone that Andy Plummer? I've been influenced by by everyone, you know. So I think as everyone thought that I was just this guy who could, <clears throat> you know, talk his way into the White House without a credential, and I pat players on the ass and give them motivational speeches. I've been on my P's and Q's for a long time. I just Hang never had. The I never had. The <laughs> there's one thing I want to point out there, Sean. Um, I, I told Dan before we started this. I've I've heard things you know we all do and it's really hard to be the person you present yourself to be but one thing that i would like to to really share about you is that i have watched you from afar for you know the past several years and i'm at a fair amount of events and one thing that i always think is the classiest thing that you do sean is that every single person you see on that driving range you know who they are you shake their hand you give them 30 seconds, 45 seconds, 15, what, whatever, whatever they need, man. Like you are always the guy out there who is like super upbeat, super positive. And I got to be honest, man, like Justin Rose is my favorite player of all time because I consider him to be a true sportsman and the mm. definition of mm. that word. Like he's just mm. a super classy grinder. And I mm. was mega excited to see what he was able to accomplish at 43 at this year's Ryder cup. But like, you don't operate, Sean, with those types of people with that kind of intensity. Tiger Woods, Justin Rose, Lydia Ko, those are warriors. And what you've talked about today is like you have to be a warrior yourself to be in that crowd because those people aren't going to put up with people who can't get it done and can only talk and can't do. <clears throat> so yeah. I think that you really have earned every step of the way. And I applaud you, Sean, because you've certainly been somebody that I've looked up to. And you definitely have put out the blueprint for people like me in this in this um, industry. So thank yeah, you. And, but and the thing is, Michael, like that, I, that means everything to me. Like that really does. And but the thing is, we didn't. What I'm trying to get younger coaches to understand is, we didn't do this on purpose. This was just about like, okay, we're super curious. Now think about society, right? I don't know what it, how it is in the UK, but probably the same. But one of the sayings growing up is, curiosity kills the cat. Yeah. And no, it, you know, so that, that's a great thing. If you want to create generations of robots of people yeah. who just, you know, just tote the line and, you know, democracy, that's a whole other podcast we can have on that. But, um, 
curiosities about what it is. And then obviously, you know, then I have these two sons and they're born and then I got to support them. And, you know, we're trying to think of, okay, um, you know, I held off on social media until basically, I think it was the end of the quarantine. I'd never done it. Um, and I can see now that I probably should have, um, but you can do it in a way that's also like, uh, you know, where there's, uh, in, in integrity, but it's a great, it's a great business tool. Um, an unbelievable business tool, as long as it's authentic, uh, right. for me anyways, as long as it's authentic, however other people do their thing. Look, if if you're doing this and you're working hard, I'm, I'm your biggest fan. Whether, like coach prime says, don't let my confidence affect yours. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, you know, who, who said, uh, Denzel said something really cool. Um, when he won the Oscar, um, they said, what do you have to say to your critics now? And he said, you know, I don't really have anything to say. And then he's, they said, well, anything. And he said, you know, I'm sorry that my angels agitated your demons. Right. So I learned a long time ago that I learned a long time ago that. That if, if I have an issue with someone, you know, um, I was just teaching my son the other day, he was pissed off about something. And I, it, I, this was the old Wayne Dyer thing that Wayne used to talk about where Wayne said, when you squeeze an orange, what comes out? And the, everyone in the audience said, orange juice. He said, why? And they said, that's because that's what's inside of it. And so when golf, society, um, politics, religion, whatever, whenever you get squeezed, like you're the orange now, whenever you get squeezed, you know, it can feel like the metaphor is not the same because it can feel like, I feel like this because of that person and that person. When I'm with them, it makes you feel that way. But all that's really doing is showing you is when they squeeze you, it's showing what's inside of you. And so that's what I really enjoy about the difficulty of life. It kind of gives me a, a way better understanding of where I'm at versus the speech that I give on that exact thing. Um, and so the nice thing to note is that um, the world can't squeeze me. And somehow my 15 and 12 year olds still squeeze the shit out of me. And I still think it's their fault. I love it, man. That is <laughs> Sean, that is beautiful. Sean, come on. Can I ask you, Sean, and this might be a really binary question, and we've covered so much ground, it's it's fascinating, but how do you measure success? Uh, well, that, you know what, it, I think that changes, right? You know, and, and for you, Dan, you could say the same thing in, in your life, right? And so I'm 49. Sure. Um, I think at one point, it was, you know, at one point, it was a lot of, of you know, it was monetary, it was getting, you know, getting awards, it was being known, it was all that. Um, and then I think over time, it starts to change as life kind of shows itself to you, or you start to understand it for what it's always been. And I think now, like, the idea of success to me is that when I lay down at night, I fall asleep quickly. And when I wake up, I'm really excited about going out and doing what I do. That I think that's it. Because I think if you if you've done all the other stuff and you know that Nirvana is not going to come from more of any of it, you know, so we have to be able to recognize like these trajectories where we go from being self-centered to then going in service to others when we go into worldly rewards to disattachment from all of it. So I feel like there's, there's kind of this first wave of like this Western mentality and then where that wave starts to go into decline. So where the intelligence is not fluid anymore, it's more crystal. It's more wisdom than knowledge. Then that next trajectory is a little bit more Eastern. Um, and I stole yeah. that from Arthur Brooks in the book, Strength to Strength, which is fantastic. That's great, man. <clears throat> and that's, you know, I, I wish I came know. up with any of this. stuff. I wish any of this was original, but I've just been really lucky to uh, I've been really lucky to. Uh, you got good source material. material. Yes. Yeah, no. So we're out of time, unfortunately, with Sean and and Sean, I have to ask really, really quick. Um, I've been privy to see a couple of things from some of these tour players that really blows my mind. And I have a question really quick before we get you out of here. But what is the most athletic thing that you have ever seen Mr. Woods do that wasn't related to golf or on a golf course? Mm, not really, because he was pretty banged up when we started. So He's really good at Call of Duty. Yeah. Like really good at Call of Duty. But the most athletic thing I've ever seen in my whole life um, was Cameron Champ hitting five iron over in a fairway bunker in, 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 in Vegas 
over a fairly high lip and you know his you know his impact conditions yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, over a high lip uh from 235 to two feet that's impressive yeah that's and, and really like, impressive and for, for the rest of your life you know if you ever intend to practice again if you do intend to practice what you should do is just get in the fairway bunker with a high lip and hit a hundred balls a day, and you won't ever have to hear a word from me. You should have, you should have seen this video. I mean, the reason I took the video is because I wanted to see him knife it right into the middle of the mound, and then this thing came out and it went up, and I, you know, it didn't matter that there was little kids around. I couldn't even avoid saying like, "Holy!" And this <laughs> ball took off, and I'm watching it, and I'm like, "There's no way that's covering it," and it covered to like this, and I just was like. And he goes, that was good, eh? I'm like, oh, you have to. <laughs> oh, that sounds about right for Cam. So, <laughs> so once again, it. yeah, thank you so much, Sean. It's been great. We yeah, really appreciated Sean. the time. Uh, it's yeah, been we'll wonderful. It for we'll, sure. We'll, we'll do it again. For sure. And for any of our listeners uh, who, like I said, don't don't know of Sean, like he said, he is somewhat newer to social media in the past few years. But Sean Foley, uh, Performance Golf, you can find him on social media does a great job. The pro sender, an amazing training tool. Even if you're not a world-class golf coach, this is something that you can use along with the videos that he's put together with David Woods. It's an amazing tool. And for all the neuroscience geeks out there that want to start looking at some of that, uh, a couple great places you can start with that would be the focus band uh, is a great place. You can kind of start getting some information as well as doing some breath work through meditation and using a product like the NeuroPeak Pro. So Sean has definitely given us all a blueprint to get better at golf. And now, once again, it's up to us to do the work with the information that we've gained. So thanks again to Mr. Double D, to Mr. Sean Foley. And until next time, keep grinding.